Hey everybody, it's Tuesday, March 29th, 2016. Welcome back to another edition of Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. So uh, right off the bat, I got to tell you, we're, uh, we're going to run things a little bit differently today uh, in part, because as you all know, I mean, if you've come and tuning into the podcast so far, uh, normally we're joined by our uh, Harrisburg correspondent, uh, Sean Kitchen, uh, who's in our Raging Chicken Press outpost out there. Uh, in our state capital, usually tells a little, gives us skinny what's happening behind the scenes in Harrisburg, what's coming up and so on. Well, Sean, well, he's a little MIA. He's a little MIA today, and I got to tell you, I'm a little bit concerned. I'm a little bit concerned. Um, uh, let me tell you the story. Here's the story, the best I can tell at least, right? So uh, as, as you may know, as you probably know, this past weekend was Easter weekend. And um, Sean went home to visit his folks. He lives down by Philly, went to visit his folks like so many people do. Um, and he didn't quite make it back to Harrisburg yet, right? So he's a little bit of MIA. Um, I tried to reach him earlier on today to kind of see if I could get in touch with him to find out what's going on. And uh, it's kind of a weird phone call. So uh, let me just play the phone call for you. So here it is. So this is, uh, hopefully the clip will kind of come in okay. Here's the, here's Sean's, here's my phone call with Sean earlier today. You see? See what I mean? That kid is out. I mean, he is out. So, uh, I don't know what to tell you. So apparently... He must have, I don't know, must be in his pocket or something like that. I don't even know how he answered the phone, but he's hes clearly, clearly out. He's not getting up anytime soon. So, I, I you know, I'm, so what's going on here? And I also was a bit concerned because if you noticed, uh, you know, for those of you who follow Sean and social media, you notice that, you know, it hasn't been a whole lot on Twitter lately. Or his Facebook page is kind of not very much up there. So, you know, I try to piece together okay, where's, where's he been, right? Where's he been? What could have gone wrong? Did something happen? And best I can figure it out is this. I took all social media feeds and I kind of triangulated what was going on. And I, I think I know what happened, right? My best guess is that Sean is in a deep carb coma after this Easter weekend. Right. So at first I was concerned, you know, cause I know like he goes, goes down to forest in Maine, right. It's a uh, great place. Um, he used to go to all the time when he was down here, uh, great craft beer, kind of micro beers and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I thought maybe that was it, you know, just too much at forest in Maine. I'm, you know, I'm sure he was there and all that kind of stuff over the weekend. But uh, I think the biggest thing uh, that stood out to me uh, was where he had been. So let me tell you this. So, Apparently, over the past couple of days, Sean has been getting um, some pizzazz pizza, right, from down in Philadelphia. Um, he went to Koch's Bakery, right, and picked up big box of unknown baked goods. But you know, you're you're talking serious Italian pastries here. So uh, my guess is that you know the butter and the sugar uh, were not in short supply. Um, then picked up a load of Primo Hoagies. Uh, and then got some cannolis and ricotta cookies uh, from down at East Gross Pastries in Philadelphia, too, as well. So I'm just kind of putting these things together, right? So he's been to multiple pastry shops, pizza, primo hoagies, right? And you know there's been that's been topped off with Forest and Maine, too, as well. My best guess is that he's got the crash from the carb coma. He's in that carb coma right now, and he's going to be out for, who knows, a couple days maybe, you know. Uh, when he wakes up, uh, I just hope he kind of remembers where he is and he's got loved ones around him uh, to make sure that they can tell him, it's all right, Sean, you know, here's a cannoli. It'll help you through. <laughs> so we'll try to check back with him a little bit at the end of the broadcast and see if, uh, you know, maybe we can get in touch with him, see if we can make sure he's okay. So but what we're going to do is after we're going to take a sh short break in a minute, and uh, I don't know if people saw this, but IUP, the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, IUP is part of the 14 state-owned universities in Pennsylvania, um, the State System of Higher Education, or PASHI. And um, they just announced, this was in the Post-Gazette, an article by Bill Schachner, um, basically say that IUP is going to move forward with what 
what's called a pay per credit tuition model. And uh, the pay per credit tuition model, you may remember this last year, um, at the beginning of last year's budget season that this was creeping up. We did, I did uh, a lot of reporting on this, the Raging Chicken Press, about what the consequences of this pay per credit model were gonna be. Um, and basically, the, you know, the short of it is it's a, it's a huge tuition increase for students. Um, but all of this takes place in the context of uh, Governor Wolf signing on to what amounts to Tom Corbett's, the former Republican governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Corbett's fifth term budget, even though he's not in office. The Republicans control the House and the Senate here in Pennsylvania. And basically, they got their wishes. They got their uh, fifth austerity budget. And uh, basically what that means for higher education, what that means for public education, what that means for access to medical care, what that means for a whole range of things is just basically uh, you know, another round of cuts, austerity and belt tightening for, the, for everyone at the bottom um, while we give kind of corporate you know, giveaways, um, tax giveaways to the corporations um, to keep doing what they're doing. So it's a, not really a good scenario. So when we come back over the break, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that. We'll talk a little bit about what the IUP tuition increase is going to look like specifically, um, but then pull back a little bit to some of the reporting we did last year to give you that context. Um, you know, this is a perfect example of what happens when you let the Republicans, or this group of Republicans, we should say, you know, this kind of post-Tea Party Republicans, when you let them run amok in your state legislatures and, um, you know, destroy those things that... Uh, are supposed to be there for all of us. So we'll get to that when we come back. This is Kevin Mahoney, uh, Raging Chicken Radio. We're back after this. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, and I'm coming to you solo this week. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening to the 14 state-owned universities that are part of the Pennsylvania state system of higher education and this article that, that Bill Schachter out in the Post Gazette in Pittsburgh published yesterday about IUP that's Indiana University of Pennsylvania's plan to drop their flat full-time in-state undergraduate tuition in favor of a pay per credit model. Now this is not new. This was something that was on the table last uh, January, February, even before then. Um, before Governor Tom Wolf um, issued his first budget. Um, Governor Tom Wolf came in basically with a budget proposal that would have restored funding to the state system of higher education, but experienced a 20% cut in funding um, through Governor Tom Corbett's first year, and that level was basically held flat for uh, the remainder of the Corbett administration. Tom Wolf came in and had a way of raising revenue and restoring funding to public higher education in the state of Pennsylvania, as well as K through 12 um, funding as well. And that was gonna be done in part by, you know, a tax on the drillers, a tax on the natural gas drillers. And we could get into that at some point, um, about whether that was a good idea or not. But when it came right down to it, um, the budget was one that was gonna uh, restore the funding to public higher education and K through 12 education. Now, uh, what happened ultimately was that budget went nowhere. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you've got the Senate and the House that's completely controlled by Republicans that are just like at the national level that are, you know, Republican Party that's, you know, kowtowing to its right wing Tea Party fringe, its Freedom Caucus, right, um, who just basically refuse to raise any revenue and um, are huge fans of austerity. Um, so basically, after months of trying, after being without a budget in the state of Pennsylvania for uh, several months, since last July, uh, Tom Wolf eventually said, look, we got to get it work on the next year's budget. So, OK, this is what you guys want. I'm going to sign off on it. Um, it was not a good budget. It is essentially the fifth straight Tom Corbett budget. Um, that is just not going to help anybody in the state. Um, it's going to help, you know, the drillers who didn't want any taxes and the corporations who are getting their handouts, but it's not going to help people um, who are looking for quality public schools, who are looking for access to affordable and high quality uh, higher education. It's not going to help people in needs of 
um, you know, medical care, and a whole range of issues. But but regardless, this is what we've got now. So at IUP, um, as Bill Schachter has reported, um, they're returning to this kind of pay per credit model. And I'll kind of read a little bit from Schachter's piece. He says, the switch to per credit pricing being announced today has potential to boost by double digits or beyond $1,100 a year the tuition sticker price for a sizable number of IUP students current year data suggests. However, IUP officials said existing financial aid plus new aid dollars generated by the added tuition revenue will ease the burden. Now, this is amazing to me that this is what we hear from IUP administrators, um, that they are basically going to roll out the same PR machine that they had last time around when they were first proposing this model. So let's see what they say. What's their argument, right? I mean, this is something that's going to raise some money, um, but what's going to be the market for it? How are they going to market that message? What's the PR behind it? And this is what they say, okay? Here you go. And this is who we're talking to here. We're talking to uh, Driscoll. Uh, Driscoll is, uh, he's the guy from, he's the president, Michael Driscoll at IUP. And Michael Driscoll made this statement. He says, IUP's per credit tuition model increases fairness. Students pay for the credits they take, he said, in a statement accompanying, today, uh, accompanying today's announcements. Mr. Driscoll said the pilot initially could generate $4 million in additional tuition revenue annually, and eventually about $8 million if the pilot continues. Okay, so you got that? So the frame is that, oh, this is all about fairness, right? This is fair, right? Students are only going to pay for the credits they actually take, right? At a common sense level, this makes complete sense, right? I mean, oh, you mean students were formally paying for credits that they didn't take, that students were somehow being ripped off by that other system? Well, not exactly. You see, this is the frame that basically says students who enroll in college, right, pay per class where they go. And then if they only pay for the credits that they actually take, right, it's going to save them money in the long run. Well, it's just, it's not true. And this is why it's not true, because as as every article about this, uh, whether we're talking about the IUP or last year, it was Bloomsburg and Kutztown and some other universities who were looking at this. Millersville and Clarion, by the way, already went to this model. Right. But the idea was that if you take 12 credit hours per semester, that is the the low end of full time status at the state system of higher education, most universities, actually. So if you take 12 credit hours per semester, it's going to cost you less. Okay? If you take 15 credit hours, it's going to cost you a little more. And if you take 18 credit hours, that's at that upper level of full-time status at the university. Uh, if you take 18 credit hours, well, yeah, it's going to cost you more. Right? And if you know, you're someone who's thinking about their wallet and you're, you're thinking about um, you know, what's fair, you know, well, that makes total sense, right? So those people who are going to take more credits, they can take more, but they're free to do so, but they're going to pay a little bit more, right? My son or me, for example, if I want to take, uh, if I want to take college classes, I'm only going to, and I'm going to take 12 credit hours, I'll pay what I will do. And then, you know, I'm not going to take those extra classes. Well, here's the problem, right? In order to graduate in four years at a university, you need to take an average of 15 credit hours per semester, right? That's to graduate in four years. And we know that there's been these huge pushes to get students to graduate in four years, not the fifth year and sixth year and so on, right? So in order to do that, yeah, you might want to take a 12 credit hour semester and pay a little bit less, but that means at some point you're going to have to make up those credits either in summer school or through an 18 credit hour semester. So in other words, you're going to pay more. Right? And on average, you're going to pay more over the course of all the credits you need in order to get that degree than you would under the kind of flat tuition, flat full-time tuition model um, that we've been operating on it since the founding of the universities. Okay? So that's number one. So let's look at actually what this actually kind of means, right? So if you talk to those folks at IUP and you say, okay, what does that, uh, what does that actually look like? Well, they have the model, and basically the model that they're proposing this year is essentially the same one they were proposing last year. So um, Schachter just did a little math, right? But say, okay, well, let's look at what if this model had been in place this year, what would this mean? And this is what he comes up with. 
if the per credit system was enforced this year, those students would have paid per credit. Even with the plan to discount per credit rate by 7%, those students would have faced a sticker price of $8,203, an increase of $1,143, or 16%. You got that? 16% tuition increase. That is the largest tuition increase that the state system of higher education the students have ever faced, right? 16%. And that's with the 7% tuition discounts um, that they were talking about in its initial or pilot year, right? That's why Driscoll, president of IUP, can come and say, hey, look, this first year, we're looking at a four, a $4 million kind of coming into the state system of higher education, right? And subsequent years, you know, in other words, when we drop those discounts in subsequent years, right, it's going to be $8 million coming into the university, right? There's no way around this. So there, you cannot say that the university is going to make this much more money, right, and at the same time say this is fair to students. It's not fair to students, right? Let's just face it. This is an increase in tuition on students of further burdening students and their families. And as we know, the majority of students, or at least a high percentage of students, but the majority of students who come to state system of higher education universities, right, are generally working class students, many first generation students, ones that are many, many, many of them paying their way through college, right? And this is going to increase that burden even further, right? They're going to have to work longer hours and take it away from their studies, right? All for this tuition increase, right? All for this little scheme. Now, let me say a couple things about this. I don't want to put this all on Driscoll. I don't want to put this all on IUP because frankly, why we're here has everything to do with the fact that our state legislators, Democrat and Republican alike, right, have walked away for their commitments to public higher education for public K through 12 education. Right? They've got locked in this market fundamentalism where basically they think everything private is good. Right, And if we just ask people to pay a little bit more and pay a little bit more and get some more skin in the game, that if they do it by drips and drips and drips that nobody's really going to notice, right? they're going to get reelected. They're going to be happy campers when it comes to the election time because they could say, look, we didn't increase your taxes. Like we kept your taxes low and all this kind of stuff. And we cut taxes to corporations and we did all this kind of stuff. They're going to be able to say all those things, right, while they're slowly bleeding dry our public education systems, right, K through 12 and higher education alike. Okay, that's their scenario. So they've done this, they've walked away. Right? Now we're in a situation where Corbett comes into office back in 2011, proposes a 50% cut to the state system of higher education, right? only gets his 20% cut. And that's a bash to the system. Suddenly that drip is no longer a drip, it's a flood, right? And suddenly it's not just a small amount of money that's leaving the state system, suddenly it's a whole lot. So now the crisis is laid bare. And so frankly, these universities are in a situation in which that in order to meet their payroll, in order to cover the cost of education, in order to provide high quality education to these students, They've got to get the money from somewhere, right? And they're getting the money from, you know, the people that need the degree, that in some ways are, are forced into a situation where, hey, you want an education? Well, you got to pay for it. What? Don't have the money? Can't help you, right? And that's uh, that is certainly not the place I wanted to be, right? Um, as a faculty member at Kutztown University, which is a member of Pachi, you know, I certainly did not want to be in a situation in which students are being seen simply as, you know, revenue sources. Um, and that our state legislator and, our, you know, all of us, frankly, because, you know, it's the voters of Pennsylvania that put these folks in office. So that we've all valued our own kind of me, me, me mentality that, you know, hey, well, I just want to get mine. I don't want anybody kind of, you know, getting their hands on my tax money to do something that might benefit everybody. So kind of this is where we are. So Anyway, they're going to take a little break, and then uh, when we come back, I want to walk you back to last year and show you how kind of similar this is um, to what was being proposed um, with the per credit tuition last year. And say a little bit about what that means. And, you know, if we have enough time, uh, we'll look at the clock here. Well, if we have enough time, we'll, we'll try to get back in touch with Sean and see if he's uh, woken up from this carp coma yet. Yep. This is Kevin Mahoney. This is Raging Chicken Radios out the coop. We'll be back in a minute. 
Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, founder and editor of Raging Chicken Press. So right before the break, we were talking a little bit about this new pay-per-credit tuition scheme that um, IUP, it looks like they're going to move towards. Um, and, you know, basically saying, look, this is nothing new. This is the same kind of stuff that we saw being floated around by university presidents, Pashi university presidents last year. And it was one of these nice little tuition schemes right, that seemed to have the buzz of the administrators ears across the country because it was a way of basically doing some significant increases in tuition the amount, the amount of money that students and their parents pay um, without uh, the the public relations disaster at least how that how that's framed so last year um, when we first started digging into this we saw that Students were going to experience anywhere between, you know, a 16% tuition increase at a place like IUP, you know, and after those students got those 7%, I don't know, tuition reduction givebacks, however they were framing it, um, upwards of 25% at places like Bloomsburg University. Um, my home university, Kutztown University, uh, when we did the math on the proposal that they were trying to push at our campus uh, look around 18 percent but regardless in whether we're talking the low end or the high end of that um, we're these are historic tuition increases never has Pashi increased tuition like this before um, sure tuition has increased um, this past year because the uh, Republicans refused to go with Tom Wolf's budget um, this past year students were supposed to have a zero percent tuition increase that was one of the demands that Tom Wolf made <clears throat> but um, because the Republicans failed to pass the budget, um, students saw about a 3.5% tuition increase. But still, that's nowhere near 16%, 18%, 25%. So last year when we were digging into this, I wanted to kind of see a little bit about, you know, how the universities were justifying this move. So I, you know, was back and forth with Bonnie Martin, who's the Assistant Director of Communications and Media Relations at Bloomsburg University. Um, about why the university was moving to the paper credit mild, uh, model. Again, this is back February 2015. And she said, this is, you know, direct quote, quote, at its simplest level, the new per credit tuition pilot pricing means students pay for the number of credits they are taking, right? Same messaging, right? It's about fairness, and that's the frame. The frame is why should students pay for more credits than they're actually taking, right? Well, we've already unpacked that a little bit. Let's see what that means actually um, when you're talking about specific students. In other words, like what's the impact, right? So this is this is what we found. So quote, previously, and this is Bonnie Martin speaking again. Previously, students enrolled in 12 to 18 credits paid the same flat rate for tuition, $3,410. That's for Pennsylvania resident or $8,525 for non-resident. Under the new pay per credit model, Tuition for a Pennsylvania resident student taking 12 credits will be $104 lower than he or she would have paid under the flat rate and tuition for a student taking 15 credits. 15 credit students will be paying about $748 more than he or she would have paid under the flat rate. Undergraduate per credit tuition for non-resident students will be set at two times the undergraduate Pennsylvania resident per credit tuition rate and will result in a savings of 1,965 for 12 credits um, and 261 for 15 credits. All right, so you got that? So at the 15 credit per hour, you saw a $740, uh, $748 increase. And what that means is that if you're gonna kind of graduate in four years, that's gonna be your average. So you're gonna see that kind of increase or you're gonna take more years to graduate. And again, you're gonna see these increases on the back end. Right. What that amounts to is when you kind of figure it all out, and this is kind of our analysis of that. Is say, so when you, as a student, you'll save money if you drop down to 12 credit hours a semester. However, students taking 15 or 18 credit hours will be hit with the biggest tuition increase Pashi has ever seen. While Pashi has regularly increased tuition between 3 and 4% over the past several years, Bloomsburg students taking 15 credit hours will be hit with a nearly 18% tuition increase um, in their tuition bill. Students taking 18 credits will see over 20% increase, right? Pretty crazy. 
right? Pretty crazy. Now, the beauty of this from the administrative perspective, the beauty of it is the fact that they don't need to come right out and tell everybody what they're doing, right? They can do it and they can claim that this is, oh, you know, we're just kind of having students pay what they, you know, pay for what they take. I mean, that's just fairness. Well, it's fairness, you know, behind the smoke and mirrors of public relations speak, right? That's really what we're talking about. So, so let me back that, back that up a bit. Number one, what's remarkable to me about what we just saw the announcement of IEP is they're going back to the exact same language, the exact same public relations spin about fairness, when ultimately that is not the truth, right? They're using that as a way of fudging around the edges so that makes it palatable to students and their parents in that initial year, right? With the full expectation that the media is not going to do their job, that we're not going to see the truth be told, right, in, in political circles as a way that our politicians, Democrat and Republican alike, can avoid having to deal with this problem head on and the problem is is that our state has walked away from public services education being the worst of it right to seeing what the impact happened under corbett is that it was insane but we're also talking about our roads and bridges we're also talking about other public projects public infrastructure projects that have been bled dry right so you know look up folks you know we've got some serious serious issues to deal with here and we better tackle them soon because, you know, they're not going away. Um, and what I keep on looking at here is a, a state that uh, does not have the political will um, to do what is necessary to make sure that we have some high quality education, high quality health care, that we have roads and bridges that are actually kind of passable. We're not the worst in the nation like we are now, but we're kind of working towards something better. All those kinds of things that we can actually do if we put our minds to it. You know, as uh, Bernie Sanders likes to talk about on the campaign trail, right? Um, we're he where we are today, not for some kind of weird, you know, natural disaster. We're here because of the choices that real people made, right? These are the results of bad political choices being made over the decades, and we got to make it stop. Um, I wish I had a little bit more time to uh, go in and talk a little about some of the other things that have been going on in Apache administrators, right? Because, you know, frankly, this has happened on both ends. On the one hand, you've got the uh, politicians that have been defunding public higher education. On the other end of things, you've got administrations that have, have continuously shifted away from the um, public model of higher education to um, basically turning public institutions into kind of, you know, free market experiments. Um, but I guess we'll have to get to that one another time. We're just kind of coming up on the wire here. So uh, before we go, we're just going to give, uh, see if we can get in touch with Sean Kitchen one more time, um, see if he has come out of that carb coma. Um, if not, uh, I guess we're going to have to see you next time. So uh, I'll let the phone ring, and uh, I'll let Sean Kitchen take us out. Okay, this is Kevin Mahoney, uh, the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, signing out for this week, and hope we get Sean back on the, you know, Back on the trip last next week. Back on the ticket. Back on the show. Back on the show. Come on, Sean. You can do it. Till next week. See ya.